Hello, BookTube. Uh, it's time for uh, today's essay. Now, it's one of the new books I got today. Um, it is Taste and Technique in Book Collecting by John Carter. Uh, it's um, Private Library Association, uh, originally published in 1948, uh, then in a second impression corrected in 1949, uh, third impression with further corrections in epilogue 1970, and this is the fifth impression 1977. And they are a series of lectures, the Saunders lectures for 1947. Now, so I thought I'd try something a little different, a lecture. Uh, so it's a bit dry. Um, so bear with it, but it's quite. I, I think it's quite interesting anyway. Uh, and I hope you do as well. And it's called Patterns in Book Collecting. And he starts out, it's chapter 6 of the book, uh, and he starts out with a quote, If the great collections of the past had not been sold, where would I have found my books? And the quote is from Robert Ho. And he starts the lecture, There are certain distinct rhythms in the history of book collecting, some of which have been audible in the brief survey of the past century we have just completed. The broadest of these has uh, something of the sweep, sweep and regularity of the tides, for it is part of the periodic function of literary and, to some extent, of social taste, to which the collecting of literature in general, and literary first editions in particular, must always remain harnessed, despite any temporary or localized vagaries. The Romantics uh, revolted from the Age of Reason, the Victorians from the Regency, the 90s from the Victorians, the Elizabethan and Jacobean dramatists were rediscovered at the beginning of the 19th century, the Romantics at its end. The Victorians in our own time, and we may confidently expect that the patterns will repeat itself perhaps in a modified degree, and no doubt with plenty of variations so long as literature is read and studied. As each tide recedes, a few more names are seen to have achieved a secure position above the high water mark, to have become a permanent part of the average reader's landscape. Minor writers of the same school or temper are returned to come up again with the next fluctuation of literary taste. Bibliophily has its own moods and peculiarities which qualify its relationship to these wider evolutions. But during the comparatively short time, less, as we have seen, than a single century, that literary criteria, expressed in terms of first editions, have been first an important and later a dominant theme in the infinitely varied pursuit of the relationship. Uh, the relationship has always been visibly close. For book collecting has shown itself uh, constantly, if not always consistently, responsive to each succeeding re-evaluation or rediscovery uh, in the general field of literary, historical, and critical appreciation of the writers of the past. Whenever bibliophily has deserted or overshot the common denominator between collectors and readers, as happened, for instance, in the youthful exuberance of the 90s, and the indiscriminate enthusiasm of the 20s. It has paid the penalty. Collectors can be, and the good collector always tries to be, a step ahead of the literary critics. But only the most determined and self-sufficient individuals can afford to be either entirely out of step or so far ahead as to be out of sight. Um, the lesser... Uh, the lesser but connected rhythms is observable uh, in the book collector's attitude to contemporary authors. A living author attracts collectors of his first editions in numbers which normally increase in proportion to his distinction and popularity, sometimes with one of these qualities, sometimes with the other in the ascendant. If he lives to a great age, concentration tends to diminish. Some, sometimes because his first editions become so large that they can never be scarce. For example, Galsworthy. Sometimes from a failing of his own powers or popularity. For example, Meredith. 
sometimes simply because younger collectors have turned to younger writers. His death usually gives a brief fillip uh, to the market, for it reminds us all that he will write no more. But this is commonly followed even with the most obvious candidates for immortality by a recession. And that recession um, may be long and deep, as with Kipling, or inconsiderable uh, in their either length or depth, as with Hardy. Its variation, however, and the author's bibliophilic standing on the emergence from it will depend on the consensus of criti critical literary opinion. For while a writer is alive, the collector can be, and among the enterprising often is, his own literary critic. But once the writer is dead, prosperity has begun. He has ceased to be a modern, to whom, in certain respects, a special set of collecting rules apply. He has become a unit in the history of his country's literature. This pattern is never quite absolute in character, for the posthumous critical reevaluations of any given author are seldom unanimous. Even if they were, there would always be dissenters amongst the c collectors. Moreover, allowance must regularly be made uh, in this, uh, as in all other genera uh, generalizations about bibliophilic taste, uh, that uh, f for the special fondness for any favorite books of our youth, from which few collectors are or would wish to be immune. And if this often perpetuates parental tastes or sentiments, uh, it is often reflects an unpredictable influence of some miscellaneous shelf which the mere accident of propinquity uh, at a respective period has endowed with an unforgotten magic. <clears throat> Excuse me. A rhythm of a different kind can be traced in the approach to bibliophily in general by successive generations of newcomers to book collecting. Novices of great wealth or strong market predilections, or those with a clearly defined purpose and plan, are often immune from its influence. Liability to it will indeed always be an, an inverse ratio to the degrees of form taste and of natural aptitude which are applied to the new pursuit. But a considerable number of persons uh, take up book collecting every year, and there have been certain periods when, for various reasons, recruits of rather mediocre quality have been particularly plentiful. Among them are many perhaps even a majority, who are infected with bibliophily in a general way rather than attracted to it through some particular channel of interest. And these will be especially susceptible to the example, if not the actual precept, of others, so that they provide the raw material or sheep for turning any reigning fashion into a herd movement. Yet with every allowance for such influences, whose direction will vary with the taste of the time, there is a special pattern which remains constant. Fine printing, or in the jargon of the trade, press books, and modern firsts always claim a substantial share of the attention of newcomers uh, with no firmly fixed affections. The reason is obvious. Moderns provide a comparatively inexpensive proving ground for those inclined to first edition collecting, while a fine book, and sometimes, alas, even simply a pretentious book, commands itself readily to many who neither do nor ever will care a button for a first edition. Color plate books and handsome, again often showy rather than strictly fine, bindings, uh, apply appeal uh, to those uh, t sorry uh, binding bindings appeal in just the same way to those whose purses are a little longer but whose first steps are equally tentative and equally liable to the necessity for the justification whether to themselves or others freedom from which only uh, will only be achieved when the novices has ceased to be a novice it is therefore a very natural and a very common cycle that begins with books which please the eye uh, 
progress to books which excite the imagination as well and ends up eliminating conventional beauty altogether. Similarly, an additional devotion to modern first often proves to be merely an apprenticeship for the business of attacking earlier and more difficult periods. In the later case, the collector who moves on on in bibliophily, though back in time, leaves no appreciable gap in a field always fully occupied by its experienced as well as the inexperienced. But every considerable wave of new collectors has a distinct and predictable effect on the market for press books and color plate books, which uh, fluctuates in response to demands uh, with almost mathematical conformity. For since each, for since such books are born precious, um, since they suffer almost not at all from what the economists call consumption, and much less the, than rare books from institutional absorption, their long-term supply is merely uh, more nearly consist, constant than that of books in any other collecting field. Uh, it is either short-term supply that varies with the periodic demand from less sophisticated and more ostentatious collectors and their subsequent extrusion when some of these turn elsewhere. Some, of course, do not turn elsewhere but develop into serious discriminating collectors of modern fine printing. Nevertheless, as Mr. Muir has acidly put it, quote, Well, uh, anyone well-informed on book-collecting history could venture a shrewd guess at the state of the money market from the current price of the Kelmscott uh, Chaucer. And that was a quote from Book Collecting as a Hobby, 1945. Uh, Quite different again, largely unpredictable, but powerfully uh, influential in bibliography philic history is the cyclic character of opportunity of acquisition. This in its broadest term was put in a nutshell by Robert Ho, uh, and quote again, uh, if the great collections of the past if the great collections of the past he said, had not been sold where would I have found my books? And the motive has been quickly explicitly recognized by such collectors as Edmund de Goncourt, who directed that his library should be sold at auction after his death in order to renew for his fellow collectors the pleasure its assembly had given him. But though the necessity for maintaining the general supply of rare and desirable books by redistribution becomes more evident every time a library or a special collection disappears into an institution, The cyclic element in such redistribution dates from long before institutional absorption became a serious menace and therefore uh, invited counteraction by collectors themselves. Lord Spencer and the Marquess of Blandford saw in the Roxburgh uh, sale an opening not to be missed. The Herber sale made an indispensable contribution to the foundations of the Britwell Library the dispersal of which in its turn gave Huntington its chance for a tremendous coup in early English books and Americana. Huth and Ho were uh, inheritors at only one generation's interval from the collections of Corsair, Daniel, and Tite. Later in the century, the sale of a number of libraries of the Roxburgh type, which had been kept intact for several generations, Beckford, Sunderland, Siston Park, Woodhull gave a similarly non-recurrent chance to such collections of early printing as General Brayton Ives and C. Fairfax Murray. Murray. The Buxton Foreman and uh, McGeorge sales put every considerable first edition collector of the early 20s on tiptoe, and in quite different department that of American literature, Wakeman took advantage of the Chamberlain sale in 1909 to provide by his own sale in 1924 a rich opportunity for W.T.H. 
Howe and other specialists of the period. Examples could be multiplied of the constant renewal of impetus given by the dispersal of carefully formed libraries to collectors of the same kind of a book in the next or even in a much later generation. In a number of cases of which the succession Herbert Britwell Huntington is probably the classic example, it was more than a matter of mere impetus. It was actually that the later library could by no other means than the redistribution of the earlier have become quite what it did. It is probable only occasionally and in a small area that the collector would echo Tennyson's confession, quote, how often has the choice of a rhyme helped me to a beautiful thought, end quote. But it is certainly true that direction has been given to a collector and the character of more than one important library influenced, if never actually formed by a timely opportunity of acquisition. So long as uh, collections continue to be sold, whether before or after their owner's death, and whether by auction or on block to a bookseller, rather than being given or bequeathed to a public or university library, so long with this cycle of opportunity of acquisition perpetuate itself, and normally at interviews about a generation. Uh, moreover, since for half a century or more, most of the big collectors have been American, its rhythm is even now more clearly perceptible in New York than in London where despite notable exceptions, an increasing proportion of the important sales are of libraries either of the haphazard country house type or like the Cumber, Lowther, Ham House or Cunliffe collections for many years ago. This tendency would only be reversed if this country regained and held for at least a generation the dominant position in the upper strata of bibliophily, bringing back from America uh, a really substantial number of those important and expensive books which have been exported thither in the past. And in spite of the present, surely temporarily, uh, difference between the liveliness of the London and the apathy of the New York market, uh, this cannot be considered a likely development. Yet except uh, in specifically American departments, London has uh, hitherto always maintain some advantages of initiative in the development of collecting taste. It is still, despite the Buxton foreman and the Lothian sale, an international entrepot for the collectors of both continents, and although English collectors and dealers can no longer, as they could fifty years ago, reckon to give points uh, to the average American in connoisseurship, expertise, uh, or method, they can still hold their own on even terms, and still sometimes win the odd trick. But these assets will only avail to offset an economic advantage, uh, offset the uh, economic advantages, the steady increasing skill and the formidable energy of the Americans, if they can be not merely maintained but increased, and they can only be increased by the conscious and unremitting efforts of all four states uh, in the Republic of Bibliophily, collectors, libraries, bibliographers, and booksellers. So that was John Carter's uh, lecture uh, from Patterns in Book Collecting uh, from the lecture series, uh, the Saunders Lectures for 1947. Uh, so yeah um, it's a bit dry um, he is an acquired taste sometimes for his writing style because it is a bit convoluted so I've, I've done my best to, to attempt to read it uh, in an understandable style but I think he, hopefully you get the gist of it um, Americans bad for uh, book collecting uh, <laughs> they, they took all the good books uh, but yeah it's just it's mainly about, you know, yet that the redistribution uh, um, sort of needs to be done for collectors to to collect, um, and rather than going to institution. Um, but there is always new things to collect, um, and if they're ahead of of the 
sort of societal and critics, uh, collectors will collect things that will in the future be very collectible, uh, but at the time are not. Uh, or uh, recollect things that have gone out of favor that will come back into favor, uh, which I think is, I prefer to do the latter. Uh, if I if I was able to go into collecting specifically, I'd be going back to authors that have been sort of forgotten uh, now and and recollect those. But anyway, um, that ends um, the essay for today or lecture in this case. Um, I'll see you tomorrow, book two. Have a good weekend.